Hello. Um, I'm really excited to be here this morning and uh, really excited to talk about this topic. It um, seems like it's, you know, going to be a sad topic, a difficult topic. But um, I will give you a spoiler that in the course of researching this topic, um, I became really excited by um, the direction that this research is taking and some of the really um, cool things that people who research this topic are doing um, in their actual research, like how they're conducting their research and also um, what their research is pointing towards. So hopefully you'll be excited too uh, as we go through this. Um, I will just tell you, uh, suicidality is like a geeky term in the suicide world that refers to um, suicidal ideation, ideas that people have about suicide planning, and also behaviors and actions that people take towards suicide. So it just encompasses everything that we think about when we're talking about suicide. So I'm going to start with this obligatory acknowledgement that I don't have any conflicts. And then we'll talk about learning objectives. So um, we're going to review major outcomes from research um, on suicidality and autism spectrum conditions, which is um, kind of a preferred term for a lot of people. Um, that's, that's, so this research that's been done so far. So this research, uh, there's a little bit of it prior to 2014, but in 2014 there was um, kind of a really important study that launched this. So it's not a very um, old field of research in, in the world of autism. Um, we'll talk about major risk factors for suicidality and autism spectrum conditions and then talk about some ideas to support people who have autism spectrum conditions um, that they, that, you know, they themselves as a community can do and also the, the rest of the world who care about them um, and cohabit the planet with them um, can do to help um, mitigate the suicidal ideation and behaviors that, that people have. So. So um, looking at major research findings in, in suicide in the general population, um, suicide is the second leading cause of death in the United States for, young, uh, for youth and for young adults, so people in the age groups from 10 years of age to 34 years of age. It's the 10th cause of death overall in the United States. Um, in the general population, 17% of adults report having uh, ex the experience of suicidal ideation. And then um, about eight tenths of a percent of adults endorse attempting suicide at some point or, or have attempted and completed suicide. Um, most suicides in the general population are completed by males and uh, the gender ratio is three and a half males <laughs> to every um, single female. It's always funny when you have a fraction for a human being. Um, and then uh, depression is a major risk factor. We also know, of course, um, there are many other risk factors like um, sort of hyperactivity or impulsivity is a major risk factor for completing suicide. In people with autism, um, suicide is the leading cause of premature death for autistic people and that um, result comes from uh, a very large Swedish epidemiological study that was conducted on a population of adults with autism. The prevalence of suicidal ideation in people with autism is 72% and going back to the general population, it's um, just 17% in the general population. Then prevalence of attempts from a, a review of the literature that actually only found four studies <laughs> um, identified a, a prevalence of attempts of um, 7 to 47 in uh, people with autism and then is less than 1% in the general population. And interestingly, in, in people with autism, women are more um, successful in completing suicide than men, which, as you recall, is very, very different from the general population. So that is an important result that I want you to keep in mind um, as we go on and talk about what we are, what people are starting to think about how how suicide sort of um, develops in people with autism, or suicidality. So there was a population-based uh, study, an epidemiologic study in Taiwan, where um, they looked at adolescents and young adults, 5,618 adolescents and young adults from a database um, that, uh, that those individuals had autism spectrum condition. Um, and they had uh, four times the number of matched controls. So within a period of three and a half years after they entered the study, so that could be either right at the start or when they were diagnosed with autism and entered the study, within a period of three and a half years, almost 4% of the people with autism attempted suicide. Um, and in a period of six years, 
less than 1%, seven tenths of a percent of the match controls attempted suicide. So a huge difference in um, youth and, and young adults with autism. Risk factors for suicidality in autistic youth include, um, so, so there have been a couple of studies that have, have looked at this. One of them, um, let me just find my notes here, uh, looked at a, a two th 2013 study, they looked at 791 children with autism who were um, one to 16 years of age, 35 children with depression without autism, and then 186 youth who did not have any kind of clinical diagnosis. And um, the, there were four demographic um, variables that hung together in 71% uh, of the kids who, um, well, 71% of the kids who had these four demographic uh, variables committed suicide. Uh, they were, or attempted suicide rather. They were um, kids who were over 10 years of age, black, and his, black or Hispanic, had low SES, um, and male. And then psychological factors that contributed to attempted suicide or ideation in um, almost half of the kids with autism included depression, behavior problems, and a history of being teased. And we know from adult research that a history of being bullied or teased is really closely associated with limitations in um, subjective quality of life. So, um, another study controlled for demographic variables and autism symptoms and found that um, increased impairment in emotional regulation in kids was associated with uh, suicidal ideation or behavior as reported by parents. And so um, that went both ways when we think about emotional regulation. So there is emotional regulation where um, people act out and they're very reactive to things that happen in the world. And then there's also problems with emotional regulation where people are just, it's called dystonia, where people are just like at a really low kind of regulation and they can't upregulate themselves to um, experience excitement and happiness and things like that. And so when people had um, either or both of those going on, they had um, a increased risk for suicidality. Another interesting finding is that, um, and, and it's sort of like kind of obvious, right? Um, Self-injurious behavior, so non-suicidal self-injury um, is a risk factor for attempts and ideation and later um, sort of suicidal type of um, acts. Um, so, but we often think of that type of behavior, especially in young people or in people who have intellectual disabilities, as being just part of their autism, right? Like we think of self-injury lots of times as um, this repetitive behavior or a sensory thing, um, and it may be a challenging behavior that we try to eliminate through um, applied behavior analysis strategies and things like that. But really what this research is pointing to is that um, people who have these behaviors as kids oftentimes develop into older people who have um, pretty, you know, pretty high risk for uh, suicidal ideation and suicidal behaviors. So these aren't necessarily like behaviors that need to be addressed by other people as much as they are um, a real indication of underlying significant distress. Um, and so Jeremy Veenstra van der Weel is a um, psychiatrist who uh, wrote this in an editorial about the importance of studying suicidality and autism. The increased risk of self-injurious behavior in younger and less cognitively able children with autism spectrum disorder is matched by an increased risk in suicidality in those at a more advanced developmental level. Um, some studies have looked, of course, at risk factors for suicidality in autistic adults. And so some of the things that they found are agitation during a depressive episode, a history of suicide attempts, um, and then autistic traits themselves, and an autism diagnosis. Those are things that have been found over and over and over again to be closely associated in research with, um, with increased suicidality, which is sort of circular reasoning in a way, I guess. But um, but uh, it's something that we'll talk about more later in a model of suicidal, suicidality. Um, social camouflaging, which many of you probably are aware of, but is this phenomenon where people with autism um, try to compensate for their autistic traits or cover them up with uh, sort of more pro-social behaviors is closely associated with increased um, suicidality in people with autism. And then of course depression, just as it is for anybody else, is, um, associated with increased suicidality. And there was a study that looked at loneliness and, uh, and found that loneliness is a contributor to depression, which then is part of the pathway towards suicidality for people with autism. 
Um, so people flip this on their heads. We flip everything on their heads and, and, and research things the other way. Looking at autistic traits in um, populations of people who um, have attempted suicide. One recent study from 2019 reported that 40% of adults who attempted suicide um, met the cutoff for autism, like significant autism concern on the autism quotient, a questionnaire. Um, and then there have been several studies by uh, this group out of England that have um, identified self-reported autistic traits associated with suicidal thoughts and behaviors. So this is an important thing, and it's kind of a weird thing in suicidal suicidality research on autism, is that they um, often look at people with autism traits and not necessarily with autism diagnoses. So why might that be, right? Um, there are not, like objectively speaking, there aren't that many people with autism compared to the general population. And then of the people with autism, there aren't that many really who, um, attempt suicide, and so it makes it really hard to study that. And so they look at um, autism traits in people and how that is related to suicide. And actually, I was sort of questioning whether or not that was a good idea, like my own authority, um, which <laughs> is legitimate. Um, <laughs> but, but then um, it's, you know, as I, as I read more and more, it does seem to be like a pretty, um, a pretty good approach to a pretty creative and, and useful approach to solving this problem. And super important, turns out, when it comes to adults with autism, because lots of adults with autism, if we think about like the kids who are being diagnosed today and what they're gonna look like when they're adults, and many of the um, adults maybe who are not diagnosed now, um, who might have been diagnosed as kids if they had been evaluated using the criteria we use today, there are gonna be a lot of them that are sort of subclinical, um, who sort of um, are better characterized by the term broader autism phenotype than by the um, strict diagnostic criteria that we use these days. So lots of people with very clear histories of what we call autism now who will um, acquire different types of skills so that they don't objectively meet the criteria for autism explicitly in adulthood, um, but still have lots of characteristics, right? So people with very subtle symptoms of autism. So that makes this an even more useful approach to looking at suicidality in, in um, people with autism who are adults. So I wanna tell you about this very interesting model of suicidality and autism. Um, this is what it is. We're gonna talk about some of the vocabulary and then we'll come back and look at it again. Um, this model is, um, it comes out of actually just um, research on people with suicidality in the general population. Um, so this, uh, so this, this researcher, Sarah Cassidy from England, has taken this model and extended it to apply it to populations of people with autism. Um, and so, that, so that's what we'll talk about. She's um, probably the most prominent researcher on suicide and autism. Oh, and I'll tell you that her first major paper uh, in 2014 on this topic looked at 367 adults who were getting a diagnosis of autism for the first time and how they experienced suicidal ideation and attempts. And so in that population, 367 adults, many of whom are women, 66% of the adults in that sample um, reported that they had contemplated suicide and 35% of them had planned or attempted suicide. So huge numbers from this um, pretty large group of adults with um, autism symptoms. Um, so let's get oriented to this model before we explore it in detail with a couple of definitions. One is thwarted belongingness. Um, so thwarted belongingness refers to the absence of reciprocal relationships. So you don't feel that you belong or you actually don't have the experience of belonging in your social world. Um, another one is perceived burdensomeness. I've never tried to say that out loud before. Burdensomeness. Um, it's a perception that a person has become a hopeless burden on their family and friends, right? So let's go back to this model now. Um, in the general population for this model, the strongest predictors of suicidal behavior, and this is true for people in the general population as well, um, mental health conditions, previous suicide attempts, social isolation, family conflict, unemployment, and physical illness. Um, so lots of people experience some of those things or, or even many of those things, but they don't commit suicide. Um, so the, the notion is that those are like distant risk factors that contribute to proximal risk factors that actually um, really contribute to the experience of suicidality. Um, so 
those, those things contribute to, to these two major variables of thwarted belonging. I don't know if there's a point there. There's a pointer, isn't there? Um, this thwarted belonging, you see it, um, and the perceived burdensomeness. They, they will not be able to hear you if you're Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks at home. Oh, I can use, oh yeah, okay, good thinking. Well done. Um, okay, so, so those different, oh gosh, those different variables contribute to this thwarted belonging or um, perceived burdensomeness. And the theory is that if you have one of those things happening, you have thwarted belonging or perceived burdensomeness, then you um, experience passive suicidal ideation. If you have both of those things happening, the thwarted belonging and perceived burdensomeness, you um, have what they refer to as the experience of a, a desire to die. Um, but in order to actually attempt suicide, um, you have to have a third variable, which is a capability for suicide. So you have to have a plan and then um, like a reasonable way to execute that plan. So those three things are necessary um, in order to attempt suicide. And different mental health conditions, as you can imagine, contribute to these um, proximal variables like depression. You can think about the ways in which depression would contribute to thwarted belonging and perceived burdensomeness. So um, with thwarted belonging, like you um, don't get out that much, you're sort of isolating yourself. Um, people maybe don't actually want to hang out with you that much because you're kind of a drag over time. Um, perceived burdensomeness, you know, you just may feel like you don't have anything to contribute. And, and so you can imagine how that works with depression. Um, psychosis also is a condition with a high rate of suicide where you, um, this sort of thing can come out. And then um, in autism, we can think about some of the characteristics of autism that contribute to these types of experiences. So in the case of um, perceived burdensomeness, there are these uh, characteristics of autism like, um, or characteristics that we see in people with autism, like caregiver burden, unemployment, um, physical and mental illness, poor self-esteem, agitation, um, that, that make people perhaps feel like they're a burden um, and get the message that they may be a burden. Um, and then autistic traits that may contribute to thwarted belonging include things like increased risk of so social isolation, the experience of loneliness, um, and difficulty establishing reciprocal relationships. Um, so, taking this model a little bit further, there is this notion of camouflaging, which uh, additional research that this group out of England, Cassidy's group, did um, showed that there's a very strong connection between social camouflaging and the experience of thwarted belonging, which totally makes sense, right? Like, I don't belong, I have to change who I am in order to fit into this situation. Um, so camouflaging comes from people with autism. People with autism have been talking this, about this for a really, really long time, right? Like Leanne Holiday Willie said, pretending to be normal was the title of her, her book. People um, have talked about this for, for a really long time. And um, people haven't been really looking at it until very recently. Um, so camouflaging is actively attempting to mask and compensate for autistic traits in social situations in an attempt to fit in better socially. Um, in one study, they asked people why they camouflage, and one woman said, mostly to avoid the bullying. Um, and so, uh, so when you, there are different components of camouflaging, and the component that was most closely associated with that thwarted belonging is assimilation. Assimilation is this um, experience of just having to, to merge with the Borg mind or you know, connect to um, the, the the sort of typical general population socially. It taps into a feeling that social interactions are not natural or genuine and you need to pretend or put on an act. Um, and as I was learning about this and researching it and typing it up, I was thinking of times when I have encountered autistic adults who um, I think of as friends where they've challenged my own social behavior and been like, why are you acting like that? That's so weird. Like, stop, what, just say what you mean. <laughs> and um, I have been like, Oh, you're right, you're right, but I don't know how to be different in that situation. Um, so they were, it was, it was just a really interesting experience that I've had, um, thinking about what it's like for them, and them feeling the comfort of being able to say, like, this is how I experience you, and it's just not cool. Um, <laughs> so anyway, thank you for listening. Um, 
So, um, so harm from camouflaging in this model, as they have sort of flushed it out over time, shows that um, camouflaging autistic traits, oh, and by the way, this has been borne out in people who have subclinical autism who have autistic traits, but not the full diagnosis, right? Um, camouflaging autistic traits in social situations leads to increased feelings of thwarted belonging, which then leads to suicidal thoughts and behaviors. So what does that mean for how we function in the world and um, what we've been asking people with autism to do for a super long time and, and even demanding that they do? Most of our current approaches um, place the onus on the person with autism to change, right? Um, treatments seek to make autistic people act or think differently. Um, I teach social skills and um, I'm asking people to be different all the time and I tell them all the time that the reason why I'm doing it is so that they have a choice to behave in whatever way they want in different situations so that they can reach their goals. I don't know if that's, if that's me making an excuse for um, what I'm doing, I don't know. Um, but, but that's what we do and we do that a lot. Um, there's a, a quote um, from, from Mitchell in the, a research study that that, that group did, uh, a growing body of research consistently showing the negative consequences of camouflaging autistic traits in social situations, demonstrating well-intentioned but potentially damaging consequences of this traditional approach. Um, other research has shown that there's this situation, they call it a double empathy problem, where People who are not autistic have trouble interpreting the behavior, intentions, um, and intentions of, of people, of autistic people, and that can lead to people without autism um, rating autistic people less favorably. So, future interventions could focus on helping non-autistic people more effectively interact with autistic people. Um, reducing the emphasis and pressure for autistic people and those with high autistic traits to camouflage their true self could even help prevent uh, risk of developing mental health problems, suicidal thoughts, and behaviors. And I will note that um, I have, uh, obviously, so much regard for this uh, Sarah Cassidy. She, um, in her research, uses the language that adults with autism want people to use. Um, and she also in uniquely included eight adults with autism in the development of her research, um, in writing the, the questions for the instruments that she used. And, um, and, and deciding what was important to research. And um, so th they had a, a lot of really interesting results that I, I'm not talking about today that aren't directly related necessarily to this topic, but, um, but it's really exciting to see people who um, are active in research taking these approaches that are so important. So um, some new bases for future interventions could be to, um, and things that people have, have called for in the recent past, um, are improving the fit between the person and the environment by modifying the environment and not asking the person to change to fit the environment. Um, and we have some tools that I think have a, a lot of potential to be really useful. Um, in, in the pretty recent past, people identified variables for the International Classification of Disability Functioning and Health, uh, the World Health Organization's um, guide to how people participate in the world successfully or unsuccessfully. So, um, so I think that's an area that's really, um, has a lot of potential to be a useful way to look at research in this area. Um, also teaching non-autistic people to interact with autistic people more effectively. Um, and of course is related then to reductions in social stigma as well. But then um, there are areas that are really important that people with autism have identified and, and that um, researchers without autism have identified as well in the course of their research that we need to continue doing, like helping people improve coping skills just as we do other people who have depression. Um, and, and people with autism maybe um, do have a potential to have uh, more challenges with coping skills associated with depression because of difficulties they may have with imagination and flexible thinking and things like that. Um, so, so that's an area that can use um, some continued work, certainly. And then uh, mitigating problems with emotional dysregulation could be very helpful for people. Improving employment outcomes, supporting social participation, reducing loneliness, all these things that people have been, um, you know, have been on people's radars and people have been working on for a long time um, could certainly continue to be useful. So that's all I've got for you all. And I think it might be, yeah. Okay, I sure will. And where will I hear those from?
where, where would, oh, oh, questions from this site. Okay, thank you. Yes, sorry. I was like, <laughs> got it. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yes. Ah, uh, yes, T uh, Tina. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Oh yes, sorry. What would a training class for non-autistic people to um, better interact with people with autistic people look like? So, um, so I said, "What do you think?" And then someone else said, "It depends on the age." Um, I wonder. I wonder what other people think. What I what I think is um, that it probably would be many sessions and it probably would be inadequate just as social skills groups for um, kids with autism to try to participate in sort of neurotypical situations, uh, neurotypical uh, social interactions would, would be um, so necessary but insufficient. I think it would um, probably address a lot of the challenges that we have identified that people with autism have, that people with autism have identified, that they experience in interacting with other people and then talk about ways to um, to appreciate what they're trying to do. Um, probably involving people with autism in those groups as well, if possible, would be super important. Um, I don't know, that's what I think, off the top of my head. Yes. To be able to reveal how their lives are different on the inside and the outside than mine are. Well said. You know, so yes. Yeah. What? Well, yeah. Yeah. Start. Yeah. What Nancy was just saying was um, understanding. Like, what's been most helpful to her is to understand what the experiences of people with autism, of autistic people, have been in terms of like sensory processing differences and things like that. How do they experience the world from the inside and the outside from them? Um, and I, I think about you know this so often said thing about how you met one person with autism, you met one person with autism. Um, so, so like you get to know autism, I think, through meeting lots of people with autism, right? And so you have to have lots of representations of people with autism to start to come to a little bit of a crystallized understanding of what it is. James? What a beautiful thing to say. So James just said one of the, the like, the, what he feels is the most important thing is um, for non-autistic people to be able to tell autistic people and probably also other non-autistic people what it was in their behavior that offended them because he has had the experience of having longtime friends who have suddenly stopped talking to him because of something that he did that offended them but they never told you and you couldn't rectify it, right? And that's so uncomfortable for non-autistic people to do. It's really hard, but you could do role plays, just like we ask autistic people to do in social skills groups, um, to practice that skill and get more comfortable with it. And then see, maybe with autistic people, um, that it's actually, like, the fallout isn't catastrophic, right? It's actually really helpful, and having that experience could help people.
Um, James was just commenting he didn't want to offend anybody but wanted to make the point that he um, interacts with a number of people, autistic people, who um, whose brains tell them to behave in ways that are scary and you want to talk about inclusion and support that but um, it can be really challenging when there actually are people who are behaving in ways that are frightening to scary to other people and their brains are telling them to do that. Yeah. Sorry. Do you, do you mean, it's a, so sorry, um, I, and I will repeat that in just a second, but do you mean for, for neurotypical people to address that with them without, or other people to address that with them without hurting their self-esteem? Correct. Yeah. Really anybody. Yeah. So, um, if they have a behavior, I mean, um, nice behavior, mm -hmm. mostly with children or younger kids, and it's, like, if they do things really badly, mm -hmm. it's it's scary for them to say, oh, hey, it's probably pretty cute. Like, it's not a problem now. Mm -hmm. They're an adult, and they're a 25, 35, 40-year-old man doing mm -hmm. the same thing. It's going to terrify people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, so, so somebody was just commenting that um, how, the question is, is how do you do that? How do you provide people with corrective feedback without um, hurting their feelings? And, and how um, she would feel very uh, hurt if somebody gave her really direct feedback that something she was doing was scaring her. Um, and I think that that is a really important topic for conversation between non-autistic people and autistic people is like how exactly do we do this? I think for many people with autism, um, or autistic people, uh, sorry, I'm really trying to say that, um, that they, they have, uh, that, it, that it isn't going to hurt their feelings necessarily. And, and oftentimes, if it's said with a good intention um, and you're open to having a reciprocal conversation about it, then they're going to feel like um, they want to know that information, right? Like they want to be able to be equipped to be accepted by other people, maybe. But that's, uh, maybe not everybody, yeah. Uh, so the comment is that over time it can be really hard to hear this like fix it uh, solution for every behavior that comes up and that over time it can, yeah, it can be really damaging to self-esteem. So perhaps doing something like taking a book that has a character who encounters a similar situation and then being able to talk about it might um, be a better, more sort of palatable way to get at that sort of thing. Um, because um, f as, as time goes on, people get this fix it situation over and over again that can be really, really demoralizing, right? Yeah, Nancy. Sorry, Tina. What are the tools that they use for these discussions are Google Stories. I think it's a useful context. And I think it's important not only to do that as something where you have a problem to work on, but when you have something to celebrate. Mm. So put it in writing when there's something to celebrate, not just when there's something to fix. And make a, you know, something out of it. Yes. So the comment is, um, to use social stories, but to also use them in, in times where there's something to celebrate, where um, people have done something really well and, and you celebrate it by writing and reviewing that social story. Great idea. Yeah. Tina? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, well done. You all passed the test. The, <coughs> excuse me. The, the question, the comment is, um, the increased rate of suicidality in women, is that because 
they um, camouflage so much that, that you know um, that they're so successful at it and that they do it so much. Yeah, that's what um, some of the researchers were, were hypothesizing was very likely the case that um, they have a much higher experience of that thwarted belongingness and um, oftentimes don't even they can't even get a referral for diagnosis um, because nobody believes that this is a relevant thing for them. Yeah, James. Good point, good point. I'm not sure that I can repeat that all, but um, I will just try to summarize um, and, and let me know if there's any major points that I missed, James. Uh, James was just commenting that there is a, um, a, a self-advocate, female, Dina, whose last name I didn't get, Gesner, um, who's prominent, at, who um, describes how uh, females camouflage, males camouflage as well, but maybe not are not as successful at it as females are, um, and that there is a social group in a city in Wisconsin where um, they accept people so widely that there is a like 50-50 composition of males and females, and um, the males are frequently um, corrected for their social gaffes or scary behaviors, um, and, and the females are not because the ma but everybody in the group, it, females are not as much, um, but everybody in the group is working really hard to um, participate socially, right? So, okay, yeah. What is it called again? Uh, Pathway. Possibility to okay, possibility. Possibility to success by Patrick Schwartz is a, a resource that for teams that gets at um, people's sense of belongingness, how successful they are at helping people to have a sense of belonging, belonging and, how well they're included in their environment. and how well they're included in their environment. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you so much for your attention and participation. Uh, thank you so very much. There was so much um, impactful in that, Megan. Um, this whole morning has been a joy and a challenge at the same time. Um, and before I release you for the last time, um, just please make sure you tell your site leaders thank you. Um, your site leader, just so you know, is Ray Dean, who's, who's up there. Um, I'm just a figurehead. Ray Dean does the work. Um, but thank your site leaders, um, because without them, we wouldn't obviously have sites. Um, thank you, too, for the fact that we, again, spanned two states. So from our distant friends in Minnesota, thank you for crossing the border and coming to Wisconsin, uh, where we are learning great things. Um, next year, Canada. We're going to have somebody from Canada. That's my goal. Um, and then finally, people have been asking about certificates of attendance. I will have instructions for those with the evaluations. Uh, for the sites, the question that I would, um, I, I, I love the question, what would a training look like for neurotypical people to teach them about 
how to interact well with people with autism and neurological differences. Um, I think that's a fantastic discussion. It makes me, me wonder. So please feel free to discuss that. And then closing, um, just a couple of thoughts. Number one, um, as soon as somebody wins the lottery and gifts me with a lot of dollars, you are all invited to my, my new uh, neurodiverse friendly communities where we go in and we teach businesses and libraries and people every day uh, how to interact with neurodiverse people. And so we will start to have neurodiverse friendly communities so that everybody is free to go shopping and everybody is free to go to the bar. Not that I'm promoting drinking, but it is Wisconsin and that seems to be a rite of passage. Um, but that's beside the point. Well, this coalition people, I'm sorry about that. Um, but I really think we need to look at it bigger as what does it look like for our communities for neurodiversity um, so that everybody is accepted. And then at the core, as I was reflecting on what Megan was saying, um, autistic people, non-autistic people, at the core of life is relationships and hope. If we could just reach out in our everyday lives, help people build those relationships, be in honest reciprocal relationships with people, have someone there that you know cares about you, someone there that you care about, have a relationship and then help each other continue to have hope. Believe that no matter what we're going through, we will get through it together. That tomorrow truly is another day. That sometimes sleep is the best dang thing that you can do for yourself. Wake up to a different reality. Relationships and hope are what keeps us moving forward. And so we extend that to our autism spectrum disorder community, as well as our developmental disabilities community, as well as, well, gosh darn it all, that is just a human need. So go out, build those relationships, give each other's hope, and hopefully we will see you all here again next year. Thank you.